Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Berenice Benayoun. I hope I pronounced her name right. Uh, she's an assistant professor of gerontology at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at uh, USC, uh, also the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, she's part of the USC Stem Cell Initiative. We're going to talk about aging and uh, all the you know the craziness associated with aging. So, Berenice, thanks for coming. Thank you, Richard. I'm I'm very happy to 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 be here to talk to you about all of this today. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, First of all, in, in the field of aging, does it attract older people or does it attract younger people? And, and why are you in it? I mean, it definitely has like a wide variety uh, of people interested in aging. And I would say there's actually a lot of young people interested in aging. Uh, and, and that could be like for, for several reasons. One of them being like people who are young are afraid of getting old, you know, and, and diminished. Or, or just because it's, it's a fascinating question. Like the, the reason I got really interested in aging was actually kind of by chance because um, so I did all my undergrad and and grad work uh, in France before I came for my postdoctoral training in the U.S. But, you know, there was always this aura of like, you know, research in the U.S. is so well funded, so, you know, so sexy and glamorous. I, I really wanted to have some experience in the U.S. So I did as an undergrad, a, a summer research experience in, in the lab of Dr. Uh, Rick Morimoto at Northwestern University. And uh, b- because basically he was a good friend of a professor at my school. And so, you know, my professor pulled some strings to see if he would just um, take me in for a summer. And I didn't really know what to expect, but um, I was put on a a project uh, with a postdoc, uh, Dr. Klaus Richter, which now he has his own lab in in Germany, actually. And, and, um, you know, we were working on the heat shock response. And so when I started writing my internship report, I discovered all the you know, all the theories that, you know, proteostasis and everything were kind of important in the regulation of aging. And that really sort of blew my mind because, and I think that's like the case of a lot of people, even in in biology until I would say the mid nineties, people used to think, and I used to think, you know, that aging is just decay. It's normal. It's going to happen. Every biological system is just going to deteriorate. And so aging is just a symptom of that deterioration. And so it's not really interesting biology. And that's really what people used to think. Uh, And and it's really the work of uh, Dr. Cynthia Kenyon at UCSF in the mid-90s that that showed that not only uh, is aging not just decay, Uh, But it's actually a very regulated process, including at the genetic level. And so the the way she sort of blew the field wide open is by discovering a a mutant worm. So Centerabditis elegans, it's like a little worm that normally lives about two weeks. Uh, And she was doing some genetic screens. And uh, in her lab, they identified a a mutant called DAF2 that could live almost twice as long as the normal worms. And that is crazy. Like for humans, that would mean like a mutant, uh, a human that could live up to 160 years old. That's insane, right? They should, they should call the worm, uh, worm Thuzula, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's like a crazy, uh, it, it was like a, a crazy thing that happened in the field where people were like, wait, if one gene can do this, because, you know, it's very easy to make animals sick. So making any animal live shorter, that's very easy. But doing one mutation, changing one thing and doubling the life, I think really awakened people to, to the idea that aging is regulated uh, very, uh, very, very uh, exquisitely at, at the genetic level. And so the reason how that can evolve is obviously very weird because evolution, you know, all the forces of evolution are on 
reproduction. Basically, anything that doesn't affect your reproduction shouldn't impact evolution because that's sort of like the main force. And so how aging, which is eminently, you know, after you have done most of your reproduction can evolve is something that's really weird and surprising. And I guess one of the recurring themes in, um, you know, what I'm interested in studying and sort of what I'm interested in doing in my research is I'm always attracted to the weird things that, you know, people aren't really sure why that's happening or they think, mm. like, well, it's weird, so it's not going to be interesting. So I, I think I have sort of this glutton for punishment attitude of, wait, it's weird. I want to understand that. <laughs> that's where a lot of the interesting things are probably. So that's that's a good thing, you know? I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's what I hope. And so, you know, I, I work on aging and obviously, so I started my lab at, at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at USC about three years ago, actually. It was in uh, July uh, 2017. So it's almost exactly three years uh, with like, you know, a month uh, difference. But what I really wanted to do was to look at things that, you know, people kind of discount, again, like the way people used to discount aging. Um, and um, two of the main things that my, my lab is looking at right now are um, sex differences in aging and, and how that affects the aging process. And again, that's something that's extremely <laughs> not well studied. And I, I will elaborate on, on more on that. And, and the second thing are the role of um, something called transposons, which you can think of as endogenous viruses that are in our genomes and how they regulate aging. And because, you know, transposons have been known to be in our genomes for a very long time. And actually, when the human genome was first sequenced, uh, people were like, well, you know, those are just repetitive. They're junk DNA. I'm sure you might have heard that term, you know, in pop culture, in like TV shows where they were like, oh, you know, junk DNA. Um, Right, just like tissues are sterile when they're not. They have a microbiome, et cetera. Exactly. And, and so those those viruses, they basically infected our great, 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 you know, ancestors. And, and so now they're in every single of our cells. But obviously, because we wouldn't be there if they were just replicating and multiplying in an uncontrolled manner, um, our cells have evolved very strong mechanisms to repress them. And so if you actually look in young, healthy cells there's almost no detectable activity for those. But if you start looking, and so that's like where the, the, main, um, the, the, the main amount of work that's being done uh, is uh, coming from, is in cancers, for instance. Cancer cells have completely lost the ability to control those, so they're super active and they're multiplying left and right. I've heard that viruses that live in our cells and ones that have been endogenized, you know, some of them are like, Rats escaping a ship when the conditions are not good, then exactly. they, uh, they say, we're out of here. And they may lice the cell or cause problems and, you know, reactivate. Yeah. And so that's, that's the case with like cancer and disease. It's actually been shown that in Alzheimer's disease, they're also completely out of control in the brain. Uh, but what has sort of emerged in, in the past, I would say, 10 years, is that they can also get um, de-repressed during normal aging. And so that's really interesting, right? Because those are, you know, normally repressed. And one of the things we know happens with age is that the immune system gets completely out of whack. It starts reacting to things that aren't there and it stops being able to react properly to things that are there. Uh, And so that's why, you know, the response to vaccine gets worse as you get older. Uh, The ability to, to come back from infectious disease is worse. Um, but at the same time, you have like a lot of inflammation uh, and, and you can see that also with a lot of the diseases that are known to be um, associated with aging, like arthritis, diabetes. Well, here, I, so, I want to give you a, a different perspective. So one way is to look at our endogenized retroviruses and say they're just, you know, caged animals waiting to hurt us. Another way is maybe they're very protective. And as we age, we lose their protection. And that's what goes to becoming part of the problem, not to, about the opposite, that they're, they're getting out and eating the, the trainers. You know? I mean, there's definitely two sides of it. Like what's really, again, interesting and that has come more into focus over the past decade is that there are pluses and minuses to, to those viruses. So, for instance, the, the fact that we, we as humans and have placenta, 
um, the, the emergence of the placenta as an organ is actually linked to those viruses. The only reason we're able to make a functional placenta is because we have co-opted, some people say domesticated, some of those uh, viral proteins that help to fuse cells. Uh, and so uh, those proteins actually create the structure of the placenta, which makes a very good surface exchange between the, the mother and the fetus, right? And, and so that would not have po been possible if we didn't have those virus, those endogenous viruses. Uh, but on the other side, we know that when they get activated and they shouldn't, then they start creating a lot of DNA damage, which is really bad. And, and um, where I was going to is that they're actually recognized by the immune system as a viral infection. And because of that, the immune system starts reacting to something that is not a real infection, but because it's not going away, you have sort of this overdrive. And, and we know that when the immune system stays active and doesn't wind down, it actually leads to tissue damage. So it, it's like, you know, when it can't find what is the source of the problem, it starts attacking yourself. And so does, does anyone um, does anyone know are there preferential aspects of a virus that trigger immune function? Is it the capsid? Is it the spike protein? Is it the DNA or RNA inside? You know, and where does this? So all of the above can, all of the above can happen for transposons. The way they're recognized is um, so the way viruses work, and obviously you have RNA based viruses or DNA based viruses. RNA based viruses, which really are going to be um, the majority of what's in our uh, DNA as humans, those viruses, the majority of those are uh, based on RNA style viruses. The way they are recognized is we have something called pattern recognition receptors, which are part of the innate immune system. So not the one that responds to vaccine, but the one that reacts as soon as there's something there. And, and so those those pattern recognition receptors, you, you can think of them as um, sort of general blueprints that our genome has evolved saying, okay, if the RNA, like double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm, that should never happen, for instance. And so you have receptors that recognize that. And if you recognize it, then you start uh, activating something called the interferon response, uh, which, uh, which is not good. Again, like same for RNA viruses, so sort of like the, the main transposon that, that is active in the human genome is in the family called line one. And those, the way that they do replicate, there is a step where you have an RNA DNA uh, duplex because uh, you have reverse transcription. So the virus is made into an RNA, is, you know, propagated as an RNA. And then to be able to go back into uh, the genome of the host, it has to be made into a DNA. And so that creates that hybrid molecule. And that's recognized by something called CGAS, which is one of those pattern recognition receptors. And so it can be recognized inside the cells once it's already infected the cells, but it can also be recognized outside. And those would be for like spike proteins, for instance, you know, when we, heard, we hear a lot about this uh, because of COVID-19, those would be recognized, recognized before they infect the cells. Um, so yeah, there's different okay. levels of it, but... A lot of what's interesting is there's, you know, we always think of the uh, immune response as sort of long-term and, and elicited and specific, but there's actually been a huge amount of evolution on the innate part of the immune system, which are just those general blueprints. Uh, and it's actually been uh, shown that, you know, of course you can't live if you're not able to make an adaptive response, but it's also, it's not viable to not have an innate immune system. If the innate immune system does not work, at least human life and mouse life is not possible. Before we recorded, you said that the FDA doesn't recognize aging as a disease. So yeah. what's the implication in terms of aging research, like what you do and other people are doing? What Does it make it much harder to do it? Or what do you have to do to navigate that? So um, in, in terms of just fundamental research on model organisms, it, it's not as much uh, of a problem, right? The FDA regulates the uh, production of drugs. Where, where it becomes a problem is when we have things now, you know, coming from aging research where we know, you know, based on um, a lot of different model organisms that they're going to improve health and lifespan uh, with, with a lot of uh, robustness, but we can't actually try that in humans 
you know, translate that to humans because the FDA says, well, it's not a disease, so you can't develop drugs against it. And so there's a lot of work that's being done by people in the aging field to try to convince the FDA to change its stance. And, and the reason comes from something that, that has been called the geroscience hypothesis. So you have two ways of considering. So, you know, when you look at a lot of diseases that become more frequent uh, with aging, so again, arthritis, uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, you know, the number one risk factor for all of those diseases is age. And so you have two ways of considering this is either these things are completely unrelated, age and those disease, or, and that's what we believe, you know, those, those of us who adhere to the ger geroscience hypothesis, is that those diseases are actually symptoms of aging. And so the way we think Uh, the current way that, you know, drug design and, and drug developments are done, again, under the, the FDA guidance, is that, you know, each of those disease has its own drugs. And so at this point, we're just playing, playing whack-a-mole with those diseases. Oh, you have hypertension, here's some hypertension drugs. You have diabetes, here's some diabetes drugs. You have Alzheimer's, here's some drugs for that. And so we think that the problem is you're actually just treating symptoms and not the underlying cause of all of those diseases. Uh, and if we look at the work that's being done on molar organisms, we actually know um, that when we delay aging, we delay all of those diseases. And, and so, uh, how do you how do you delay aging? I thought there was um, eight, nine, ten hallmarks of aging. Is that true in your experience? And you know, how do you delay aging? What are some ways yeah. it's worked? So th there is definitely, uh, I think, nine um, considered hallmarks uh, of aging. How do you delay it? Well, there's some drugs, and uh, I, I, uh, I don't know if I want to name them uh, there for the, the, for the public to try them themselves. Well, we could say, specifically <laughs> saying to the public, don't try these because yeah, bad things can happen to you, you know, yeah, which is true. Don't, don't try these at home. But for instance, one of the best success stories of aging research in the lab is a drug called rapamycin, which is actually used for um, uh, people who've had organ transplants to actually prevent rejection uh, of the graft. Uh, but when you use it on, you know, worms, on, on, um, on mice, on rats, it actually is amazing. It's an increase of 30% in lifespan and, and a decrease in most of the metabolic problems that you have with aging, like uh, weight gain, and uh, there's improvements in cognitive function. So it's, it's really beautiful. I mean, one of the reasons you definitely would not want to directly bring it to humans right now is that it has some side effects that are, um, you know, that most humans wouldn't like, like it does induce cataracts. And so, you know, th this is the idea of doing more harm than, than good potentially. Uh, and, and there are some reproductive effects for males only. But that, I, have a, I have a question about yeah, when, when lab animals are de-aged somehow, you know, rabomycin, et cetera, and then they age, you know, are they allowed to age again? And if so, is the aging different the second time around? So usually all of the experiments that have been done, usually once we give it to them, we give them, uh, we give it to them regularly. What's interesting for rapamycin is that it's, I think, the first uh, intervention where they waited till the mice were already middle-aged before starting it. Um, and, and so we know that it could work even if you don't, if you start it, you know, after people are already middle-aged. Um, and, well, and what are like, some general learnings that you, that people have gotten from working with lab animals? Like, you know, um, have they given a treatment and then they stop and the animal like dies in two seconds or does it just go back to its normal aging pattern? Um, you know, if the animal's older to start with, is it less effective, just as effective? Like, are there any general learnings? So there's, there's been limited um, experiments doing the, the type of, of things you describe, where there's sort of a, a treatment and then you stop and then you would restart it. That hasn't really been done. Again, there's only been this, the majority of research that's being done right now, is, and it's to just see the biggest effects are, are usually with just constant treatment. The study where they started the rapamycin at mid-age, they actually had very similar effects than doing it for the entire life. Um, and, and so that would be very... Um, promising. Uh, one of the things that works really well, and again, like don't try this at home uh, without the direct supervision uh, of, 
a dietitian. But this works from yeast to worms to fish to rats to even monkeys is something called dietary restriction. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not just being on a diet. I, I want to make that clear. You have to make sure the amounts of vitamins are, are correct, that the balance of micronutrient, macronutrients is correct. It's just that you're diminishing uh, caloric intake, but in a very controlled manner. So just starting to eat, you know, butter lettuce is not going to do it, but it works and it improves health, lifespan, cognition, decreases the amount of cancers, uh, decreases the amount of cardiovascular disease, all of those things. So it works really well. A lot of people have been trying variations on, on, on this. So you can just like, there are different ways of, of doing it. The first examples of it were when people were just restricting dietary intake, you know, as soon as the mice were young adults, you know, and you have beautiful effects, lifelong effects. But a lot of people have been thinking like, seriously, how would you give that to humans? Because no sane human will ever accept to eat 40% less than, you know, what is actually normally recommended. It would oh, be there's some, there's some people that do that. They, I've heard about, you know, one guy that hung out with one of these people and he was like, eat one blueberry and savor it. And it took him like 20 minutes to eat one blueberry. And he was like, oh my God, this is horrible. But I've heard there's people that do this. No, that, yeah. And, but the problem is they're usually not followed by dietitians that really control the, the vitamins. So it, unless it's done in a clinical setting, there can actually be a lot of malnutrition problems. Uh, but some yeah, I've I, heard like they get very cold easily and they move around slowly and like their metabolisms are really, really low. And you know, so it may not, even if it was done quote unquote right, it doesn't sound like a great trade off. It sounds like a horrible but, existence. Th this is where something like actually, uh, s um, there's uh, someone in, in the, the School of Gerontology, Dr. Walter Longo. He came up with a way of getting all of the benefits of calorie restriction, but without, you know, <laughs> the pain that you would have uh, in sort of a society, uh, your interaction with society. And mm. so he came up with you, have you Have you tried the fasting mimicking diet? Have you tried it? I, I have. Um, I have not, but that's because I love food too much. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping we can figure out a way to trick your body into thinking that it's doing mm. it. Um, w without actually having to do it. But um, I can tell you that a lot of people in the building at the School of Gerontology do it, uh, and they're extremely happy with the results. Actually, Walter himself does it. Um, I hope he does. I hope he doesn't eat, like, ice cream and fast food while he's preaching this. You know, that would be bad. <laughs> well, you know, he wouldn't have been the first, but, no, he actually does um, adhere by it. Uh, I'm actually doing something different because it – suits me more, but that's something that's been promoted. Again, it's different ways of figuring out how to, you know, uh, manipulate how much energy your body thinks it's getting. Uh, and, and that's basically what leads to improved um, health and lifespan. It just kicks in the preservation and protection, cellular protection mechanisms. What I have been doing is something called inter, um, intermittent fasting. And it's been shown to have, again, very similar benefits to fasting mimicking diet or just straight uh, calorie restriction. Intermittent fasting, and again, I'm not you know, preaching that everyone should do it because you need to be careful about how you do it, but it's been shown that if your body uh, does not eat for 16 hours, uh, you then get the metabolic benefits uh, of doing you know, dietary restriction. And you can eat normally. Uh, in the eight remaining hours of the 24 hours of your day. It's just you have to make sure you are fasting for 16 hours straight. And so again, this is like ways that we found to trick our body into engaging sort of the protection mechanisms. And, and that's really actually that long-lived worm that I mentioned earlier is actually based on, on that exact pathway that's being activated with all those dietary manipulation. Um, Basically, that long-lived worm is a mutant in something that's called the insulin-like signaling pathway. Uh, and basically, when you have high amounts uh, of insulin uh, signaling, those the cellular protection pathways are dampened. Uh, and when you have low amounts of them, then the cellular protection is enhanced. And so with calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet, what you are doing is diminishing the amount of um, activity of this pathway, at least either all the time or at some time in the day, 
to make sure that you have time to kick those protection mechanisms into overdrive, basically. And that's how you can get, you know, better health, longer, um, uh, longer health span. The, the idea is really, if you think about it in, in an evolutionary manner, one thing that has been shown is usually when you have those manipulations uh, of dietary intake, usually fertility takes a dive. Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it means if, if you, you know, obviously evolution um, uh, didn't act on people trying to live longer. It was, you know, again, always on reproductive output. If you're trying to have babies when there's not enough food to go around because, you know, dietary restriction in the wild while our species were evolving, that would be just not having enough access to food. If you're trying to have progeny when there's not enough food to go around, then the odds of your progeny to reach reproductive age is going to be much lower because if there's not enough food for you, odds are there's not enough food for your progeny. And so yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it may not even be evolution. It's just, it makes sense as an allocation of resources that's preferential to your progeny. Exactly. But in some cases, it may be the opposite way. You can't get pregnant if there's not enough uh, nutrition in you. Exactly. And so that's exactly what's happening is usually when um, you have plenty of nutrients. And so again, you're not dietary restricted. Your the reproduction is fine and you're able to have as many babies as you, as you want. But the maintenance of the soma, you know, of the body of the parent is not prioritized. Most of the resources are allocated to reproduction. But if there's not enough food, then you're trying to protect the host as much as you can until such a time that there would be enough food. So then you would have the ability to reproduce and have a better chance for your progeny to reach adulthood. And so that's really what people think in terms of evolutionary forces that might have shaped the response to calorie restriction being so conserved. Uh, and usually, again, limiting reproduction, improving uh, lifespan are really sort of, it's one or the other. Right now, we haven't really found a way that increases both. What are some of the big questions that you're trying to answer with your research? It sounds like you've already gone over them, but specifically, yeah, but like what kinds of experiments are you doing and what do you, what do you hope to elucidate soon in the next year or so? So the, the one thing, so again, I mentioned it in passing, not um, as deeply. Uh, the, the one thing I'm really interested in understanding is how sex differences can be leveraged to understand fundamental things about aging and how we can use it to improve um, the health and the aging of, of both women and men, actually. So you might be surprised to know, or, or not, may, maybe you've already heard it from someone else, that over three quarters of all lab experiments are only ever done on one sex of animals, either, and usually it's males. I know, and you know, I realize this is so stupid because women have a cycle. So let's say there's a new drug, okay? Mm -hmm. Not only has it probably not been tested on women, but yep. how has it changed as a woman goes through her cycle? It could be dramatically different. So it's just stupid that they don't do that. I don't understand yeah. why. They, they just say, oh, if they're pregnant, don't take it. But uh, there's, even that's just like a, a general statement. So it's just it's just strange, you know? Well, like the, the general, and I'm not going to name names, but the, the general attitude up to very recently was just like, you know, what you know, females are just males with hormones. Hormones make things complicated. So let's just study the males and whatever we find in the males is probably going to be true in the females. That was the general attitude. And it is really wrong. Um, I think what's really um, drawn the point home, at least in the aging field, that sex is super important uh, is that the NIH intervention testing program, they found a number of interventions that do lead to increased health and lifespan. Well, what's really interesting is the overwhelming majority of the interventions that work, you know, that can increase health or lifespan, either do it only in one sex or do it much better in one sex than the other. And so really that drives- Really, the, like what? Like rapamycin, it works much better in females than males. And huh. um, there's this estrogen um, derivative, non-feminizing estrogen derivative of 17-alpha uh, estradiol, which only improves the health of males. Absolutely zero effect on females. 
And, and that really tells you one thing, that if aging was exactly the same thing in females and males, then you would expect that the exact same intervention would have the exact same effect, right? Right. And yeah. So the fact that it doesn't tells you that there is a big difference. And and again, it's it's been um, completely overlooked because people hate working with females because of the cycles, because it makes things complicated. And you know, I'm right now you don't see me, but I'm making air quotes. Uh, it's complicated, or you know, hormones make the data noisy, or whatever. The thing is, like everything, if you control well for it, you can discover really interesting things. And so what my lab has been doing is really systematically trying to take that into account. And so we're focusing on the innate immune system, uh, you know, that first line of defense immune response that I mentioned earlier. And what we found already is that, so we know that with aging, it goes haywire. But um, with our experiments where we don't actually just look at the males, we found that it actually goes much worse in females than, than in males. So for macrophages, which are the cells that we're looking at, there's up to 20 fold more things changing with age than in males. That is insanely a lot of things. Uh, and so we were curious if that was due to hormones. And so we actually started to really segregate or um, young females in the different phases uh, of the hormonal cycle. And we did find um, that the immune system of females is much stronger uh, in when the, they're in the high estrogen fa phases uh, of their cycle uh, and much less strong when they're in the low estrogen phases of their cycle. So there is a direct relation that, that could explain why with age, we know there's less estrogens, uh, you would have all of those changes and so poorer immunity. Uh, and so we're looking at that. And, uh, but that doesn't explain all of the differences we see between the females and the males with age. So one of the things that we are doing, and we finally have the mice, so hopefully when the research reopens <laughs> uh, after the COVID closures, we're gonna be able to start doing that. Uh, we're using a really cool animal model where we can actually swap um, in, endogenously, we can do a sex reversal. So, you know, you have a mouse, it has an XX uh, karyotype, so it's genetically female. Uh, but we can inducibly reprogram its ovaries to become testes, which means it's going to start producing testosterone instead of estrogens. Uh, and we're going to use those mice to see how much of those sex differences with aging are hormonally driven uh, and how much are genetically driven. Because again, people don't really think about this, but you know, there's a lot of talk about personalized medicine and let's sequence everyone's genome to tailor um, you know, treatments. But the biggest genetic difference that you can have between any two individuals is a whole chromosome. And so you would think people would think of that in terms of starting personalized medicine by taking into account the fact that you have, you know, females versus males genetically. And there's a lot of immune genes on the X chromosome. Uh, and, and there's a lot of genes that regulate the expression of other genes on, on the X chromosome. So that's definitely going to be something. And so, you know, I'm not gonna go into too many details, but based on the data we already have, we're able to identify, you know, non-sex related things that are activated by those hormones, you know, or these chromosomes. And um, we know that those are driving the differences, you know, in the immune response that we can see with aging in the females versus the males. And since yeah. those are not directly hormonally regulated, we can actually use these to see if we can restore, you know, immune homeostasis in old animals to be like young, regardless of sex. And so that's one yeah, of the- I've wondered about, um, has anyone looked at um, organs, you know, like a woman's liver versus a man's liver, a man's heart versus yeah. a woman's heart? You know, like, are there any large differences it is there? extremely different. Actually, the liver, it's funny that it's the first- example that you picked. The liver is one of the most sex dimorphic organs that exist. Uh, and it's really interesting because one of the biggest things that's different in expression, so I'm sure you know, because you probably heard that most of the drugs we take are metabolized in the liver, right? Right, right. The, the enzymes that metabolize those drugs are actually the groups of the group of genes that is most differentially expressed between males and females. Uh, and so we mentioned the inequality of like female versus male animals in, in fundamental research, but that's also the case in clinical settings. Most 
clinical trials are done exclusively on males. And again, the idea is people are like, well, we don't want to have to see if there's an interaction with the pill, the birth control pill, or the cycle. You know, there's always the same family of excuses. But because we know there's such a big difference in drug metabolism, genes in the liver, it's very possible that a number of drugs that have failed phase one or phase two trials have failed because they were tested in men and would have actually been successful if they had been tested in females. Actually, uh, you know, I have, I have a question for you. In, sure. the, in the animal models, I hope this, they're not this stupid. Are people testing only males in the animal models? Because oh, yeah, yeah, I just thought, like, what if you had a that, that is what know, I would a, a rat study? <laughs> what if you, what if you had a rat study with male and female rats, and then then when it came to human trials, they only did it in men. I mean, that would be another kind of error, possibly. You know? Yeah, no. So that's one of the big problems. Is the majority of animal research up until you know, I would say maybe five six years ago is when it started to change. But not really. It's still like the overwhelming majority is males only. And that's because people are like, well, I don't want to have to take into account cycling. So it's actually like the the animals are one of the main problems. Um, People are starting to include both sexes, sort of like kicking and screaming, because the NIH is starting to require when, you know, when you make a grant proposal to ask for money to do research, the NIH is starting to request to require that you do include female and male animals. But there's a lot of people who just give lip service, who say that they're going to test both and end up just testing the males just as usual. And and that is a real problem. And I can tell you, and I'm not going to name names, that I've had prominent people in the field of aging telling me that I shouldn't focus on sex differences because there was it was unlikely that it would end up being interesting. So this is a real <laughs> endemic problem. <laughs> I, well, uh, I mean, I do, I, I understand, you know, at some point you can't test every permutation of person, you know, that's totally understandable, but at the very least you should test men and women, you know, yeah, it, it's, as silly. If, it's as if half of the population on this planet is being ignored systematically. Yeah. Hmm. So, and, and like I said, it, it's, and we know there are fundamental differences biologically again like drug metabolism the immune system um you know i the reason we 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 chose to look at the immune system is because the immune system is actually also extremely different you may or may not know that if you look at 10 people who have an autoimmune disease in humans for every basically for every man that has an autoimmune disease you will find nine women who have one nine times more in women On the opposite end of the spectrum, and I think people also saw this a lot with the news with COVID-19, men are extremely more sensitive to infectious disease. So in general, not just COVID, women um, survive at much higher rate infections than men. So you have sort of this sliding scale of immune system where sort of like the women, the female immune system is more reactive, more looking for problems, which means sometimes it finds problems when there's none, and that leads to autoimmune disease. It starts attacking yourself. On the other hand, um, the male immune system seems to be, you know, less looking for the problems that aren't there, which means no autoimmune disease, uh, but not as reactive when there's an actual pathogenic challenge. And that is why men in general tend to have less good odds upon infectious disease. And that is when you just look, you know, regardless of age, but then when you put the aging axis on this, you can see that the trajectories are also different with age. Uh, and, and actually the female immune system with aging, and especially after menopause, starts resembling uh, the male immune system. So, you know, there's a lot of things to, to be looked at. And, um, and obviously, you know, you complicate things when, um, you know, like in my lab, I told you I, lo- I love looking at complicated things. We don't just look at aging, so not just one axis, but we also look at um, the, the sex of the animal, so females versus males. And so now we have data where we always have at least four groups, uh, where most people only have two groups. And so it does mean it costs more money. It does mean you need to be more careful you know, about your analysis. Uh, but I also think it means you can have conclusions um, that are more broadly applicable than when you just look, you know, 
just look at males or just look at females and make a general conclusion about something happening with age, right? So I think that's also our strength. Yes, we, we make life difficult for ourselves, but I think we are also putting ourselves in a situation where we can find, um, you know, very interesting information that we wouldn't be able to find otherwise. I guess that strikes to the heart of science is this reductionism. Um, but biology is not like that. And, you know, men only, let's say, are, is just another hallmark of reductionism. So it's hard. I mean, there's a trade-off. You can't do everything. Yep. And But you, you can't reduce things to such an extreme where you are fooling yourself. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so, again, like, for instance, you know, with those uh, interventions I mentioned for, like, longevity, um, there's a lot of those interventions we wouldn't have realized worked if we didn't look at both sexes and so this is where you would say like you know okay you're a man you're more likely to respond to 17 alpha estradiol um, but you will not respond very well to rapamycin like we know there's huge impact on um, uh, the ability to produce sperm in uh, mice that are uh, treated with rapamycin there's no impact on fertility for the females right so you can make very informed decision on what's the best course of treatment if you actually know how treatments or interventions interact, right, with uh, a lot of factors. And so, again, that's where the whole idea of um, uh, personalized medicine comes from. But, you know, the argument I want to make is personalized medicine starts, you know, at a very granular level at just separating females and males. That's like the first separation we should do, uh, you know, before going and looking at specific SNPs. So yeah, makes sense. Well, very good. Well, Berenice, um, it's been a good call. Um, we're kind of out of time now, but what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? So I am active on Twitter, but I also have, uh, so at uh, BB Paris 1984, uh, and uh, I try to, to keep the lab website, which is on, hosted on the, on the gerontology school's website, uh, updated for all of the new things we do. So I, uh, I love to discuss more about these things. So uh, you know, if people want to give me a shout out on Twitter, I, I'd be happy to engage. Very good. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No problem. It was my pleasure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.